between 1914 and 1960, a series of very important decisions were made with regard to the growth and development of the American School of Archaeology, making us very unique. What is now known as the Classificatory Historical Period in American Archaeology really began with writers who were focused on this notion of chronology building or building timelines for specific climatological and cultural regions throughout the Americas. In fact, when you are exposed to history books today, as your children may in fact be reading topics having to do with archaeology or the history of indigenous peoples or First Nations peoples, very often there will be a timeline that will accompany these narratives. These timelines are in fact drawn from the work of archaeologists at this time. As you can imagine then, the focus at this time for many archaeologists working in regions such as the American Southwest was to create a time ordering of events and in a sense to be able to take the select sites they were working on and impose them or place them within these particular time orderings. In other words, they were building chronologies, discovering artifacts, discovering sites, discovering patterns of artifacts within sites, and then placing those discoveries or juxtaposing them in a sense in relation to those particular chronologies. The technique of seriation, often applied to pottery styles, accompanied this methodology and this perspective. Let me provide you with a definition for seriation. Seriation is the ordering of materials in such a way that adjacent items in this series or this order, this constructed order, are more similar to each other than those items further apart within the series. Let me repeat this for you for your notes. Seriation in this case is a technique. It's an ordering of materials in such a way that adjacent items within a series or within a constructed order are more similar to one another than to items further apart in that same series. You can apply this complex concept to the styles of cars. As Americans, we are very enamored with our vehicles. We grow up, our parents own vehicles, we associate memories with these vehicles, and the styles of these particular vehicles. If we're to step back for a moment and take a look at, let's say we go to a car show and take a look at the, the wide variety of car styles that are present, we can very easily and very quickly, even without the use of, um, in this case, descriptive cards or uh, car owners, we can start to put these cars, because of their style, into a order, and we can relate to that order. We can take a look at a car from 1978 and remember a trip we took to the Dakotas. Or we can take a look at a car from 1987 and remember getting our driver's license. This basically is what seriation is as a technique. However, it's applied to more than just cars. So this idea of chronology building and the use of a technique like seriation really relates to the ordering of artifacts by their style. However, as you know, archaeologists want to assign a timeline to these artifact examples or these scatters or patterns of artifacts. And at this time, between 1914 and 1960, many archaeologists in the Americas wished to link their timelines into larger global timelines in the Old World. In order to do this, they employed a new methodology. They utilized stratigraphy. What came to be known as the stratigraphic revolution in American archaeological circles as we approach the late Second World War era really is founded upon the idea that the greater depth or with greater depth we have a deeper or earlier deposit. So the land that you are currently standing on right now is modern. As we begin to dig down into layers of soil, and this can be applied to the geological record as well, 
we are moving into horizons, as they are called, just like we have soil horizons. We move into horizons that are older than those above them. This principle allowed archaeologists focusing on style or applying seriation to talk about what particular styles of pottery or of projectile points or arrowheads were older or younger than other artifactual examples. This means that artifacts that were recovered at deeper stratigraphic layers or in association with deeper soil horizons were older. They also represented different connections to the local land and local patterns of weather and ultimately climate. This allowed archaeologists not only to be able to recognize a style as being older than another style, but they were also able to reconstruct the culture of a people inhabiting the same general location and how people of different time periods related to the plants and animals, to the patterns of weather and ultimately climate that surrounded them. As you have already noted, many of the periods within the historical development of American archaeology overlap with one another. Well, our end to this brief discussion will also demonstrate one final overlap. Between 1940 and 1960, we see the rise of a new philosophy in archaeological circles. In this case, especially again those associated with the uh, New World, we saw a combination of archaeology to its parent discipline, in this case anthropology. Archaeologists such as Lewis Binford, for example, realized or recognized that archaeology by its principles, by its founding concepts, was inseparable from the larger discipline of anthropology and its goals and aims. What has come to be recognized as the modern period in American archaeology was a time when archaeologists increasingly became interested in classifying cultures before we take a look at the work of Lewis Binford, we have to focus on another important figure at this time, in this case, Walter Taylor. In the late 1940s, Taylor and his colleagues pioneered a method known as the conjunctive method. He describes this in his 1948 work, A Study of Archaeology. Taylor, in this case, saw archaeology as an integrated discipline combining the study of diet with things like settlement patterns, tools and how they were produced, and other elements, all within a holistic view of the past. This approach, along with his open and often specific criticism of leading archaeologists of his day, caused dismay among many archaeologists at the time. Though initially his ideas were discredited by Binford and others, later archaeologists, even those working in the field today, recognize his ideas and his um, technique of conjoining resources or ideas or materials in order to create a more holistic or total picture of the past to be really integral to what we do on a daily basis. Many historians today recognize the ideas of Lewis Binford as they were applied in the 1960s to be directly drawn from many of Walter Tyler's writings and his work in the field. In terms of Lewis Binford and some of the processual archaeologists that followed him or were inspired by his work, what I would like you to retain for this class is that Binford brought to the Taylor argument this idea of archaeology not only as anthropology but also as a science. So as you took a look initially in your readings at the scientific method and all of the procedures that must be in place in order to test a hypothesis and ultimately attempt to disprove a theory, all of these concepts were applied by Binford in a very standardized way to his study of the archaeological record. In Binford's work, Data, Relativism, and Archaeological Science, published in 1987, he also brings up the idea of analogy. What he means by this is that after we move through the scientific method,
we have to realize that there is more than one resource for archaeological data. In this case, we can look to living peoples in similar environments or in similar areas where a climate resides as examples to better understand the artifact scatter of the past. So in a sense, ethnoarchaeology, which is now a specialization in American archaeology, really begins with Lewis Binford. If you look at the term or the concept ethnoarchaeology, it really is comprised of two things. One, ethnography, or the study of living peoples, or a living culture, and archaeology, the study of the past, through looking at material remains or cultural materials. It makes a lot of sense to combine these two concepts together, but in the late 1980s, this was fairly new. In conclusion, let's also highlight the work of two important archaeologists, American archaeologists in this case, Gordon Willey and Philip Phillips, who in 1971 summarized many of their ideas and uh, really the growth of the discipline up to that point in their publication Method and Theory in American Archaeology. Throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, Phillips and Willie, along with many of their American colleagues, not only applied the relative dating techniques of the stratigraphic revolution, again, one soil horizon being older than another, but they were also employing scientifically now the absolute dating techniques that are very common to archaeological circles. Best known among all of these absolute dating techniques where you assign a range or a specific date to an artifact or a deposit uh, would be something like carbon-14 dating or C-14 dating or C-12 dating. Willie and Phillips were well versed in the cultural sequences and classification schemes for the New World and uh, were also very well versed in terms of how these particular timelines were compiled and many of the important sites associated with important points in those timelines. They also recognized that these sequences were part of a larger global historical development of modern human civilization. So in a sense when you look at the work of Willie and Phillips, you're really looking at a culmination of everything that had gone on before, from our interest in understanding the past, collecting exotic objects and artifacts that are associated with the past, to understanding the peoples of the New World, to understanding the age of the planet and its relationship to things like uh, soil profiles or the geology of the planet. Uh, we were interested in applying new techniques, new ideas, new methodologies, new technologies to better uh, understand the past and to understand the past scientifically. As a result, we come to recognize today, and this is something again building off of the ideas of all of these individuals that I've been highlighting throughout this lecture series, we've come to recognize that the most important byproduct of archaeology is to explain the past. Take a moment now to look at this schematic diagram. I've put this together to give you an idea of how archaeologists working as anthropologists perceive or examine the pasts. So in a sense, let's, let's kind of walk through this together. In terms of the topics that archaeologists look at, they look at or attempt to reconstruct a community's sense of belief or ideology. They attempt to understand how that community was connected to the groups and communities that surrounded it, sharing maybe the same landscape. They take a look, of course, at technology, how peoples of the past extracted energy from the local environment. They attempt to define what community was, what is a society a thousand years ago. And they take a look at their subsistence strategies. The subsistence strategies, I would argue, become the most important quality in this overall process of interrelated interacting concepts 
in the archaeological record how people acquired the food resources that they needed to survive, not just on the individual level, but on the group or community-wide level. Ultimately, this diagram also characterizes the important qualities or the important relationship that exists between a population of people, a breeding population, or a segment of a living population, and the local environment. If you think back to the first portion of our course, this relationship between the living organism and its environment, this ecological relationship, becomes very important for understanding not only the biology of the organism, but also its daily behaviors. Now we'll take a closer look at an archaeological example, in this case a case example, from the American Southwest, the work of American archaeologist Jeanette Mobley Tanaka. As an American archaeologist, Mobley Tanaka has a pretty well-established perspective when it comes to approaching an archaeological question. In this case, she's going to take a look at gender in, and its expression in the architecture of the Pueblo uh, prehistoric American Southwest. This slide here summarizes the mode of inquiry that not only Mobley Tanaka but all American archaeologists today take as they attempt to fit together the past, the pieces of the past, and ultimately reconstruct uh, a culture in its totality. As you will note, context is the most important quality that archaeologists initially address. Context is considered to be really the starting point for any discussion of the past. How and when were the artifacts, the objects, the materials, the cultural materials that we study, how and when were they deposited? And what do they tell us about a people? Ultimately, context requires the interrelationship between three variables, and I have these listed here for you space, the physical location of the artifact or site, form, the physical characteristics or stylistic qualities of the artifact or the site, and time, the temporal location of that artifact and or site in the overall timeline of the region. Before we get started, take a moment to jot down these qualities of our case example. As you will note, Tanaka is interested, in this case, in understanding the role that women played in the rituals of the prehistoric past, specifically the pit house to Pueblo transition. And we'll take a look at a timeline of the past, but basically this is a transition between a, a period of um, archaeology where we're not seeing any pottery to a period where pottery becomes very, very prevalent. Uh, in what we find and, and what we examine. This is referred to as a pit house to Pueblo transition. The term pit house to Pueblo really relates more to architecture. People move from these underground or subterranean pit houses to these more apartment-like Pueblos that you see uh, when you take a look at uh, important pictures of the American Southwest. Uh, for example, the Parks Department has a series of websites that you can visit to take a look at this beautiful architecture. But what Mobley Tanaka wants to do is understand how women's lives changed or remain the same, what they contributed to uh, the local community during this period of change. So what she's going to do is she's going to focus in on the appearance and the role that mealing rooms or rooms within Pueblo architecture that were associated with, in this case, the production of ritual foods when those appear and where those appear, and how they relate to the overall city plan. The most important feature in the study, the archaeological study, of the architecture of this Pueblo age in the American Southwest or in the Four Corners region of the United States is the Kiva. You take a look at this slide, you see these circular subterranean features. These features are referred to as kivas. I always describe to my students that a kiva is very similar to a worship environment or a church. After looking at the historic and living record today, we realize that these kind of church-like environments within the architecture 
of the Pueblo Southwest were really designed for dance and for celebration. Uh, and many of these uh, highly ritualized religious practices or traditions were designed to ensure the prosperity of the community, to ensure, in this case, that from one season to the next there would be enough food to eat. Mealing rooms, or these areas where the meal, the corn meal, was produced for the ritualized food that was eaten as part of these celebrations, uh, are found in close association with uh, the kiva or worship environment, sometimes even within the kiva environment. So Mobley Tanaka wants to take a look at, uh, first of all, the relationship that women had to the production of cornmeal in the society, both in the household and in these uh, highly ritualized religious landscapes or event uh, horizons, and then ultimately based upon the relationship that mealing rooms had to these important areas of worship, what was, or how can we use the architecture to better understand the role of women in relation to these ritualized uh, events in these areas of worship or these worship events? In order to make this connection, Tanaka, Mobley Tanaka, had to turn to the ethnographic record, to the historical record, uh, associated with the Zuni people of the Southwest and take a look at the relationship that women had uh, in uh, events of ritual or in ceremonies or in events associated with the uh, religious dance. Take a moment to write down these uh, important key points 